This lecture is part of an online algebraic geometry course on schemes and will cover some basic properties of schemes such as being reduced or integral or irreducible or connected. So suppose we've got a scheme S. Then one property is it could be integral, which means that it is both reduced and irreducible. So what does it mean for a scheme to be reduced and irreducible? Well, a scheme is reduced means um, that all stalks are reduced. So you remember there's um, a stalk at each point, which is a local ring. So these are local rings. And what does it mean for a ring to be reduced? Well, this means it's nil radical is zero. And the nil radical is the elements x with x to the n equals naught for some n. Um, and what does it mean for a scheme to be irreducible? Well, irreducible just means the underlying topological space is irreducible. So S is not the union of two proper closed subsets. And S is not empty. And if a um, space is irreducible, then it also has the property of being connected, which is a bit stronger, which means um, that the only sets that are open and closed are the empty set and the whole space S. And also we usually add the condition that S is, is itself not empty. Uh, so um, this gives a, a, a sort of forewarning of one of the problems with scheme theory in that there are huge numbers of definitions of various properties and it's a real headache trying to remember all the different properties and what the relations between them are. We don't get this problem nearly so much if we're looking at varieties. For example, all varieties are automatically integral, reduced, irreducible, and connected. So we can sort of ignore these properties completely because they're automatically satisfied. Um, anyway, let's just have a few examples. Um, so the first example, um, let's look at the spectrum of uh, Kx modulo x squared. So this only has one prime ideal. Um, so its spectrum is a point, although you can think of it as a point with a tiny tangent vector sticking out if you like. And this is irreducible because its spectrum is just a point, but it's not reduced. On the other hand, if we look at the spectrum of k x y over x y, this is essentially just the union of the x axis and the y axis. Uh, I guess we should also remember that it's got a sort of generic point here and another generic point there. So it's got two generic points. And this is reducible because it's the union of two proper closed subsets, the x-axis and the y-axis, and it's reduced because this ring has no nilpotent elements, which as we'll see in a moment is equivalent to the, the, the corresponding scheme being reduced. If we want an example of a disconnected scheme, you can look at the spectrum of kx over x squared minus x. And um, this is isomorphic to the product of k with itself. So its spectrum just looks like two points and is not connected, but is still reduced. Um, uh, so we're now going to examine these properties in a little bit more detail. So first of all, let's have a look at the property of being reduced. So when is S reduced? And we can ask when is the spectrum of R reduced. So let's look at the case of an affine scheme and ask when it's reduced. Well, the answer is 
when the nil radical of R is zero. Um, so uh, uh, this is quite easy to check. So um, the spectrum of R is reduced just means that the nil radical of all localizations at prime ideals are zero. And so we want to show that if all the local rings of R have vanishing nil radical, then R has vanishing nil radical. Um, and this is quite easy. So suppose that X is not equal to zero and X to the N equals zero for some X in R. What we can do is we can pick um, some maximal ideal containing the annihilator of X. That's all the things such that X, Y equals zero. And since X is not zero, this is a proper ideal. So it's contained in some maximal ideal. And then it's easy to check that X is non-zero in R localized at P. So, so R localized at P is not reduced. So if the ring R has a non-zero nil radical, then one of its localizations at primes has a non-zero nil radical. Conversely, if um, Rp is not reduced, this means that x over a to the n equals naught for some x um, that's not zero in Rp. So, and this implies that b x to the n equals naught for some b not in p, uh, by definition of something being zero in the localization. So this is equal to zero in Rp. Um, so, um, so that, um, so, um, so bx to the n is equal to zero. And on the other hand, you can easily check that bx is not zero in, um, is not zero. So, um, so r is not reduced. So this shows that a ring is reduced, having zero nil radical, if and only if all its localizations at P are reduced in the sense of having zero nil radical. Um, so th this indicates that being reduced is a sort of local property. So the following are equivalent So first of all, a scheme S is reduced. Secondly, um, SP is reduced for all points P. Um, so this is a local ring and this being reduced means it's nil radical vanishes. Thirdly, every open affine subscheme is reduced. And fourthly, S has a cover by reduced open affine subschemes. And these equivalences are um, typical for a large number of properties that, 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 that there are many properties that hold if and only if every local ring has the property and if and only if every open affine subscheme has that property and if and only if there's sufficient if s is covered by subschemes with that property so you tend to say um you you, you might you might characterize this by saying being reduced is a local property In other words, you can tell whether a scheme is reduced or not just by sort of looking locally everywhere near every point and seeing if, if, if that um, holds. For examples of some properties that are not local, note that being integral or connected or irreducible, 
are not local properties. For example, if you just take a scheme um, consisting of the spectrum of a product of two fields, it just consists of two points. And, and each of these points is integral, connected, and irreducible. So, so we can cover this scheme by open sets that have all these properties, but the scheme itself is not integral or connected or irreducible. Um, so so the, these are sort of global properties. You sort of have to look at the whole scheme all at once to see whether or not it has these properties. Um, Um, next, next, let's have a look at connectedness for an affine scheme, say the spectrum of some ring. And this is very easy to describe. Spectrum of R is connected. It's just equivalent to saying R has no, what are they called, idempotence. X. So, so an idempotent just means x squared equals x. Um, it has no idempotence x other than naught and one. And of course, we should also add the condition that R is not the zero ring, which is a zero ring is an exception to almost everything. Um, and this is easy to see. Suppose x squared equals x with x not equal naught or one, then, um, then um, the spectrum of R is the union of two disjoint open sets where A is the set of ideals such that A is in P, and this is the set of ideals such that B is in P. And you can see that, um, uh, sorry, that, that x is in p and 1 minus x is in p. And x times 1 minus x is equal to naught, so every prime ideal is contained in one of these, and no prime ideal can contain x and 1 minus x because that would mean it was, was zero. So these are both open sets. So the spectrum of x, so the spectrum of r, is not connected. Um, on the other hand, if the spectrum of uh, if if the spectrum of x, if the spectrum of R is a disjoint union of two sets A and B, then by the sheaf property we can just choose an element A to be one on the set A and zero on the set B. Uh, sorry, there shouldn't be A. There should be x. And then one minus x is zero here and one here, and you can see that x times one minus x is zero everywhere, so it's equal to equal to zero. Um, when I say it's one here, I mean it's image in all the local rings is the identity. Um, so uh, next let's have a look at uh, the property of being integral. So when is the spectrum of R integral? And the answer is when R is an integral domain. Um, so this sort of splits the property of being an integral domain up into two apparently different properties, because you remember saying S was integral means it has to be um, reduced and, irreduci and irreducible. So saying something is an integral domain is you're really combining two quite different properties into one property. Um, so let, let's, just show, sh let's just prove this. Um, first of all, if, if R is an integral domain, it's very easy to check it's both integral and, and sorry, it's both reduced and irreducible. So we just have to show that if A, B equals naught in R, where R is reduced and irreducible, then A equals naught or B equals naught. Um, um, so since A, B equals naught, this means that the spectrum of R is the union of 
primes containing A and primes containing B. And these are closed. subsets. So um, since R is irreducible, so the spectrum of R is irreducible, implies um, it is either this set or this set. And we may as well suppose that it's this set. So we can suppose um, that all primes contain A. Um, well, there's a result from commutative algebra that this implies A is nilpotent. So A is equal to zero as R is reduced. Um, so um, all we've got to do is to um, explain why if all primes contain A, then A is nilpotent, which we'll do on the next sheet. Um, just have a Quick warning, if you're looking at coordinate rings of algebraic sets, then you may remember that an algebraic set is irreducible if and only if its coordinate ring is an integral domain. So it's easy to absentmindedly think that being irreducible is equivalent to being an integral domain. That's only true if you don't have nilpotent elements. Once you start allowing schemes that have nilpotent elements, you've got to remember that being that 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 a space being irreducible does not imply its coordinate ring is an integral domain. You also have to check that it's reduced. Anyway, um, we'll just finish off that proof by recalling the following standard result from commutative algebra, that the nil radical of a ring R is equal to the intersection of all prime ideals. And this is fairly short, so I'll just recall the proof. On the one hand, um, if x to the n equals naught, then x is in all primes, because um, if a product of elements is in a prime, then one of the elements is. So if x to the n is, is in a prime ideal, then x must be in it. On the other hand, um, um, suppose x to the n is not equal to naught for all n. Then we look at the following multiplicative subset, 1x, x squared, and so on. And we notice that since x to the n does not equal to naught, m intersection i, so intersect the zero ideal, is equal to zero. Now pick a maximal element of the set of ideals i with naught contained in i and i disjoint from m. Now this exists by Zorn's lemma. And um, we're actually using the fact that x to the n is non-zero because we have to show this set of ideals has at least one element to apply Zorn's lemma and the one element is is the ideal zero. So, so if, if x to the n was zero for some n we couldn't find a maximal element of this set of ideals because it would be empty. So anyway we've we found a maximal ideal and now it's easy to check i is prime um, this is part of the general thing that if you take any collection of ideals, then the maximal elements of that set very often turn out to be prime ideals. So, so um, X is not in some prime. So this shows the nil radical is the intersection of all prime ideals. Um, this is actually, again, fairly typical of scheme theory. And we have some geometric result about schemes like saying um, the spectrum of a ring is integral if and only if the ring is an integral domain. And this turns out to depend on some funny result of commutative algebra. So scheme theory involves enormous amounts of commutative algebra like this.
Um, next, we should look at irreducible subsets. of a scheme. And these turn out to be exactly the closures of closed points. Um, notice this fails for varieties because um, the closure of a point of a variety is always just a point and you don't get all the irreducible subsets. And we'll just do the case of affine schemes the spectrum of R. Um, it's often easy to reduce to the case of affine schemes just by using the fact that any scheme is covered by open affine schemes. So I won't bother with the details of this. So all you do is you let C be an irreducible closed um, subset of the spectrum of R. And we want to find a prime ideal, in other words, a point of spec of R, whose closure is C. So we just put i equals the intersection of all ideals in C. And i is prime because um, if a, b is in i and a is not in i and b is not in i, then C is the union of two closed subsets Um, we can take the set of ideals P such that A is not in P or the set of prime ideals such that B is not in P. And this fails. You can't do this because C is irreducible. So, so this is not possible because C is irreducible. Um, so we found our prime ideal i, and now all we do is we have to check that c is the closure of i. I guess, strictly speaking, it should be the closure of the set whose only element is i. Um, and we can check that um, c is contained in the closure of i because i bar is just the prime ideals containing i. On the other hand, i is contained in the closure of c um, because for any open set of the form df with i in df, um, we have um, f is not in i. So you remember there's a basis for the open sets consisting of the, of the sets df, which are just the prime ideals um, not containing f. Well, if f is not in i, so f is not in uh, j for some j in the closed set c, because i is the intersection of all elements in c. So um, this element j is in df. So we've shown that for any neighborhood of i, we can find an element of C in that neighborhood. So we've just shown that I is contained in the closure of C. And now C is closed, so I is contained in C. And again, because C is closed, we use the fact that C is closed again, we find that the closure of I is now contained in C. So C is contained in the closure of I, I closure is contained in C. So C is the closure of the prime ideal, or the, rather the closure of the set whose one element is the prime ideal i. Um, we'll finish off by doing an example to illustrate all this stuff about um, connected components and irreducible sets and so on. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the group ring of a group G, which is just cyclic of order four. So we can take the integer group ring or we can take the rational group ring, or we can take the group ring over the complex numbers, say. So the group ring is just going to be, you can think of this as just being z of x 
over x to the 4 minus 1. Um, so this is representative of an abelian group. We could do the same thing for any abelian group, but this is the simplest case that gives something um, interesting going on. So what does the spectrum of this look like? Well, it has four components. So its spectrum looks like this. And it has four prime ideals. We can have x minus 1, x plus 1, x minus i, x plus i. Because x to the 4 minus 1 factorizes into the product of these four irreducible factors. Um, and um, all of these correspond to idempotence. So we can have the idempotent 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed over 4 which is 1 here, and 0 here, and 0 here, and 0 here. And there are four other irreducible uh, idempotents. In fact, there are 16 idempotents altogether, but there are four irreducible ones. So here we get 1 minus x plus x squared minus x cubed over 4. Here we get 1 um, minus ix plus minus x squared plus ix cubed over 4. Here we get 1 plus ix minus x squared minus ix cubed over 4. There's a 50-50 chance I've got some of the signs wrong here, by the way. Um, so what we see is that these four components actually correspond to the four complex representations of the group G. So that's the four ways for G to act on a one-dimensional vector space. It can act as multiplication by 1 minus 1 i or minus i. Um, well, if we try doing this over the rational numbers, well, it doesn't factorize like that. We only get three prime ideals. We get x plus 1, x minus 1, and x squared plus 1. So now we have the spectrum as three components rather than four. And we've got a map of rings here, so we get a map of spectra in the opposite direction, which obviously does this. So here, two components have been combined into one component when we sort of reduce our field from the complex numbers to the rationals. Um, now, what happens over um, Z of G? Well, here things get rather more complicated. What we end up with is we get sort of you try and draw a picture of the spectrum. It looks like this. So this is a copy of the spectrum of Z. And this is a copy of the spectrum of Z. And this is a copy of the spectrum of ZI. And they all have generic points. And the map takes these things to the generic points. And then there are also lots of other points because on this copy of the spectrum of Z, we have a point 3, x minus 1 here, 3, x plus 1. And here we get 3, um, x squared plus 1. And here we get a similar point for 5. But here, the we sort of get two points for 5 because we've got an ideal 5, x minus 2, and 5x plus 2, and so on. So you remember the spectrum of z of i, some of the primes split. And at this point here, something funny goes on because we only get one ideal, which is the ideal generated by 2 and x minus 1. So here we now have three components, three connected components, and these correspond to the three rational representations of g. And here we only have one component. The scheme is actually now connected, but we have three irreducible components. Rather bad terminology here. So um, we, we have one irreducible component there, one irreducible one there, and one irreducible one there. And the spectrum is the union of these three irreducible components. And so this describes the rational representation of G, and this describes the complex representations of G. So what does this say about the integer representations of G? Well, as you see, what it says is that integer representations of G are really rather complicated. And 
This is why people do representation theory over fields, not over arbitrary rings in general, because the representation theory of a group over a ring starts looking very, very complicated, as you can see from the spectrum. Um, just finish off by pointing out that we also, if you look at this point here, um, there's a sort of non-reduced ring associated with this. So if you take the ring ZG and quotient it up by the prime two of Z, this actually becomes the field F2, um, where you take polynomials in X and then quotient out by X to the four minus one, which is equal to F2 of X modulo x minus one to the four. So we get a, a non-reduced ring. Um, so this is one of the reasons why modular representation theory, where you try working over a finite field becomes rather complicated because you start picking up non-reduced rings. Um, okay, that's all about these properties. Um, next lecture, we will discuss some further properties related to being notarian.